It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks very much for inviting me to the UTRC Invited uh, Lecture Series. So this uh, work is uh, based on the PhD research of my, oops, let's turn this on, student Ashish Hotha was in his final year of his PhD at Purdue. And so as the title and, and abstract indicate, Ashish's research has focused on understanding the impacts of human decision making on robustness and security of large scale and shared systems. Okay, so this talk is gonna be basically revolving around two broad classes of problems that uh, we've been looking at together. One is essentially uh, what are known as common pool resource games. So where a bunch of individuals are sharing a resource that could fail with a certain probability. And the second is uh, a class of what are called interdependent security games where individuals are trying to protect their own resources when they're connected with, uh, with others. Okay, so the overall motivation and the sort of the main theme of the problems that we look at in my group are how do we design big networks and systems to be resilient and secure. Okay, and so you can ask these questions about both engineered systems like the power grid, the internet, communication systems, and so forth. And you can also ask them about natural systems such as, you know, the classical fisheries or climate systems or social systems and, and so forth. And so there's obviously, this is a multifaceted uh, question and problem, right? And so there's different aspects to this. Well, so for example, we look at how do you design distributed algorithms to coordinate things in networks so that they're secure? How do you design network topology to have certain robustness uh, quantities and metrics and so forth. Uh, but the aspect of this problem that I'm going to be touching on here is the aspect of you can't talk about resilience and security of these systems without understanding how the humans who are interacting with these systems are going to use such systems. Okay, and so we're going to be looking at this from a mathematical perspective. And so game theory is a kind of a natural framework to be reasoning about individual decision making when they're interacting with each other and with these systems. So we're going to be using the framework of game theory, uh, but you know, despite the fact that there's this huge history to game theory, uh, much of the classical models that are typically adopted in game theory uh, don't use some models of human decision making that have been identified in behavioral economics and psychology and so forth. So there are systematic deviations in the way humans behave and make decisions under risk that aren't necessarily captured by existing analysis in game theory. So the motivation here then is to really bring some of those models into a game theoretic framework and start answering the question, how do these uh, identified deviations from classical behavior impact the way humans use these systems? Okay, and so as I said, we're gonna be looking at two classes of games, resource sharing games with failures and interdependent security games uh, when humans have misperceptions of probabilities of risks. Okay, so let me just give you a background on uh, classical models of decision making and how, and the behavioral models that we're gonna be using in this work. So the classical way to think about these things is through the framework of what's known as expected utility theory. So suppose that you have some uncertain outcome and that outcome could take different values, Z1 to Zn, okay, and each of those occurs with probability P1 through Pn. So under expected utility theory, an individual is gonna perceive what comes out of this in a certain way. So essentially they take the value they shape it through some function u, okay? And then they take the expected value of u uh, to give the way they perceive the value of this outcome. Okay, so if u of z is just equal to z, then this is just the expected value of this outcome. So these are known as just risk neutral individuals. They're just looking at the expected value. And if u of z is concave in z, then essentially the individuals are known to be risk averse. So essentially using Jensen's inequality, you can show that people will always prefer sure outcomes to uncertain outcomes. Okay, and I'll give you uh, more concrete great example here. So, but empirical studies in behavioral economics and psychology suggest that humans deviate from classical models where U of Z is just concave everywhere. And so we're going to be bringing in one specific uh, framework called prospect theory, which captures certain systematic deviations from uh, concave utility functions. Uh, so this was identified by Kahneman and Tversky, it won the Nobel in 2002. Just a quick question on, yes. like, on the units. I mean, so Z is a set of outcomes. Yeah, so there... the units are different than, than the utility. So when you write UZ equals to Z, I don't understand the units. Uh, you have Z, Zs are real numbers here. Yeah, so essentially you can think of it as, uh, so I'll do an example right here. So essentially you can imagine, so consider the following two uh, scenarios, right? So in, in outcome one, you're given the choice of just walking away with a win of $50. And in outcome two, you're given the op option to flip a coin and you win $100 with 50% probability and $0 with 50% probability. Okay, and so in this case, the Z's would be 100 and 0, and then the Z in that case would just be 50. 
So in this case, the mean value between these uh, in each of these scenarios is 50 bucks, right? So if you're a risk neutral individual, you're not going to care about the difference between these two outcomes. They're going to be equally good for you. But when you're given, when people are given this uh, kind of choice in practice and experiments, they tend to pick the first outcome. They tend to pick the sure thing versus the uncertain thing. Okay, and so this mod, this sort of aligns with what was uh, typically thought would be the behavior, which is that people are risk averse uh, when they're faced with gains. They'd rather take the sure thing versus the uncertain thing. But what was interesting was that if you were to flip the signs, right, and you were to make people uh, face this choice, so in option one, you're definitely going to lose 50 bucks, so you have to give me 50 bucks. Or I'm going to give you option two, so with the 50% probability, you lose nothing, and with 50% probability, you lose $100. Okay? And so now, interestingly, they found in experiments that participants tended to switch to option two. So there was a chance here that they would lose nothing, and so they would take a risk in this case and flip the coin. Okay, and so again, in this scenario, the mean value is the same, it's still $50, but in this case, when faced with a loss, people no longer went for the sure bet, they went for the uncertain outcome. Okay, and so that led to what was characterized as saying participants or humans tend to be risk-seeking in losses. Okay? So essentially, prospect theory captures such deviations from classical models, and prospect theory has some main features. So one is that people don't necessarily just view the outcomes of experiments in absolute terms. Like 50 bucks isn't just 50 bucks. People compare things to references, right? So they compare things to their current state of the world and they see if they're winning or losing with re uh, respect to that. And then they behave differently if they're in a gain scenario versus a loss scenario. Okay. The other thing is that there's diminishing sensitivity. So essentially, if I win a million plus a thousand dollars, pretty much feels like a million bucks. But if there's a difference between zero and a thousand dollars, then it feels like a big difference. Okay, and so you get this sort of S-shaped curve here, which captures diminishing sensitivity to larger and larger gains and losses. Okay, and the fact that this S-shape also captures the idea that people are risk averse here and risk seeking here. It's a convex function here and a concave function there. Okay, and the third uh, aspect of the prospect theoretic uh, value functions or utility functions is that there's loss aversion. So essentially, if I win a dollar, maybe it feels like I'm winning a dollar, but if I lose a dollar, it may feel like I'm losing five dollars or ten dollars, right? So losing hurts more than winning feels good. Okay? So all of this has been experimentally observed and there are mathematical parameterizations of how people then view losses and gains. And so the prospect theoretic utility function essentially looks like this. So essentially Z0 is a reference point. So if I give you a, uh, an outcome with a value of Z, I compare Z to Z0. If Z is bigger than Z0, I'm in a gain regime. So the difference, the amount I'm actually gaining is going to be raised to the power of alpha to shape it according to the sensitivity parameter. Okay? And alpha is a number between 0 and 1. When alpha is equal to 1, it's just a straight line. Similarly, if z is less than z0, then basically I'm in a loss regime. I feel like I'm losing something. And in this case, I look at the amount that I'm losing with respect to my reference point, shape it according to the sensitivity parameter, and then I amplify it by this constant k, which captures this loss aversion. So losing a dollar feels like losing k dollars. Okay? And so the important parts about the prospect theoretic value function are this alpha and k. Okay. The other aspect of behavioral deviations is that people don't really perceive probabilities in a linear way, right? So people don't really necessarily understand probabilities. And so uh, when experiments, these researchers have found that people tend to overweight low probabilities and underweight high probabilities. So they think low probability events occur more often than they do, and high probability events occur less frequently than they do. Okay, and so essentially, this is the true probability. This is the perceived probability. The blue line is a true probability perceiver. Okay, and so the green and red lines are essentially people who overweight probab low probabilities and underweight high probabilities. So there's different mathematical parameterizations of such curves. Um, and so we're going to be using in this research uh, one parameterization called the prelac weighting function. So you don't have to look at this, you know, it looks complicated. Essentially it takes a true probability x, spits out a curve that looks like this, and that's parameterized by beta, which is some number between 0 and 1. When beta is 1, you get a straight line. As beta gets smaller than 1, you get more uh, inverse S shaping. Okay? Alright, so clearly if people are mis are perceiving 
values and probabilities in this skewed way, that's going to impact how they use resources when there's uncertainties and uh, probabilities of failure and uh, different types of gains and so forth. Okay, so the question then is, what is the impact? If we bring in these types of utility shaping, what, how does that impact the way people use shared resources? Okay. So the first class of games is going to be this resource sharing game. So this appeared, these are, uh, you know, we've been working on this for quite some time, but it appeared in Games and Economic Behavior this year, and uh, part of it will appear in CDC later this year. So the framework is as follows. So I think most people here might have heard of the tragedy of the commons. So essentially it's the idea that if you have a shared resource and you have multiple selfish decision makers that are using this resource, they tend to overutilize the resource and it leads to suboptimal outcomes for society. Okay, so this is not new. This is uh, you know, very well known. It goes back all the way to environmental economics. So they're, they're known as common pool resource games. Uh, but it also appears in engineered systems in the context of congestion games, so traffic and communication networks and so forth. Okay. So, for example, as a classical congestion game, you have two uh, nodes, a source and a destination. You have n players, and they're trying to send traffic from the source to the destination, and there's two parallel links. The first link has a constant delay per unit of traffic, regardless of how much traffic there is on the link. The second link has some other delay, which depends on the total traffic. There's some congestion that occurs on the link. So then each player has to decide how to split their traffic between these two links in order to minimize their overall delay. Okay, so that's sort of a canonical congestion game type of uh, framework. So these are shared resources. You have multiple players trying to use it. So here we're going to consider a slightly more general formulation here, which is uh, known as a common pool resource game. So here you've got n players again, and each player has access to a personal resource, which they can invest in. It's a safe resource. It gives them a guaranteed return on their investment of one unit per uh, unit of investment. They can also invest part of their uh, time or money in a shared resource, and then the shared resource that Characteristics of the shared resource and the return that the shared resource gives is going to depend on what everybody else is doing. So you can think of this as that second link in the congestion game where the total traffic, the delay depends on the total traffic. Okay. So the shared resource, so if player I invests XI in the shared resource, we're going to denote the total investment by XT. And so the shared resource has a rate of return function R which depends on the total investment xt. And so if the shared resource yields a return, player i is going to get xi times rxt. Okay? And because we're going to be interested in uh, fragile resources and robustness and, and so forth, we're going to introduce the notion of uh, probability of failure of the resource. So essentially the resource can fail if it's overutilized, and so there's a probability of failure function P of XT, so, which depends on the total utilization. So in general we're going to be considering increasing probabilities of failures, uh, failure with utilization. The more the resource is used, the larger the probability that the resource fails. Okay? And if the resource fails, we're going to assume that the players don't get any return and they lose whatever investment they've made in the resource. Is, is R um, increasing with XT or decreasing? We'll consider both. Yeah. 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 Okay. Any other questions on the very broad framework here? Okay. So within this context, we're going to be asking questions as follows. So first of all, does there exist a Nash equilibrium in this game when players have behavioral attitudes, right? So there's uncertainty about the gains that are coming from this resource and the probability of failure and so forth. Okay, and so suppose that these players have these prospect theoretic perceptions of this resource, of the, of the gambles that they're taking. What are the impacts uh, of that uh, type of perception? So first of all, when they have such perceptions, does there even exist a Nash equilibrium? And the answer is going to be yes, otherwise there's not not going to be much for me to tell you, right? So then the second thing is once we've established that there's a Nash equilibrium, the more interesting questions arise. So first, what are the characteristics of the Nash equilibrium? How did the behavioral perceptions, these prospect theoretic risk attitudes, affect the failure probability of the resource at the Nash equilibrium? So we're going to be asking questions like, if you have multiple players using this resource, what is the failure probability at the Nash equilibrium compared to the failure probability when there's a single person using the resource, right? So essentially, if you have a resource and you can use it as a private good, so only one person can use it versus a public good where anybody can come and use it. How does the failure probability increase due to allowing multiple people to use it? Okay. Next question is what produces a higher failure probability? Is it better to have a society where everybody has homogeneous risk attitudes or is it better to have a society where people have heterogeneous risk attitudes from the perspective of utilizing this resource? Then you can think about that and guess what the answer might be. And then, how do you control utilization of this resource? 
If you want to try and reduce utilization, can you impose something like a tax mechanism to try and prevent, to reduce the utilization and reduce the failure probability? So we'll answer that question as well. Okay, so just to refresh your memory about the prospect theoretic utility function, remember z is the outcome, uh, perceived value is u of z here, there's going to be alpha which shapes the s shape, and then k which amplifies losses. So just remember those two parameters. Okay, and we're going to allow the uh, individuals to have their own alpha and k values, so they can be heterogeneous. Okay, so in this fragile CPR game, what are the gains and losses? So when the resource succeeds, when the resource doesn't fail, it's going to give you a return based on what you've invested in the resource. In that case, the return is going to be xi times rxt. Okay, and then that's going to be shaped according to the prospect theoretic value function. It's going to have this s shape. So that's going to be raised to the power of alpha i for player i. Okay. Now, if the resource fails, which happens with this probability p of xt, then the player loses whatever they've put into the resource. They don't get any return from it at all. And so that loss, again, is shaped according to this s shape. So it's raised to the power of alpha i. And then it's amplified by their loss aversion parameter ki. Okay. So in this case, these are the two possible values that the uh, user is going to get, depending on which scenario occurs. So, so, that's, so that's what they perceive, or that's the actual? So this xi times rxt is the actual, and this is what they perceive to be the gain. It's the raised to the power of alpha i. And this is the actual loss, x minus xi, but this is their perceived loss if it occurs. Yeah. So if you now take the expected value with respect to these things, right? So uh, remember, there's two things. There's value function skewing and there's probability skewing. Here in this work we have not considered probability skewing yet. Okay, it turns out to be complicated enough when you just do value function uh, modifications and so we're going to just analyze the impacts of what happens with the value function on the equilibrium. So if you take the expected value of these two things, this is the scenario where you get a gain and that occurs with probability 1 minus pxt, that's the resource doesn't fail, and then this is the scenario where the resource fails which occurs with probability pxt and this is the loss that occurs. Okay, so player I is trying to choose their investment in the shared resource Xi in order to maximize this utility function. All good so far? Okay. All right, so we want to analyze this utility function, and so we're going to make some assumptions on P and R. So this comes back to Derek's question here. So R of the XT we're going to assume is a concave function. Okay, and, uh, but we're going to allow R to be either increasing or decreasing. So decreasing R basically captures the classical congestion types of type effects. So the more people are using the resource, the, less, the more congested it gets and the less return I get on it for every unit of investment. But we're also going to consider increasing R. And increasing R captures what are known as uh, econ economies of scale or network effects. Okay, essentially the more people are using it, the better, the more benefit I get. So imagine an online file sharing platform where essentially the more people are participating this platform for every unit of time I spend on that platform, the more benefit I get from that platform. Okay. P of xt we're going to be considering as an increasing function and we're going to take that to be a convex function in xt. And one of the motivations for considering convex functions is that often if you're considering these large scale systems they exhibit these tipping points where they're in a fairly sta uh, safe state for a long period of time but then once you pass a certain threshold they quickly transition into an unsafe state. Okay, And so by capturing a very sharp convex function you can capture such uh, sudden transitions in a robust uh, system to a fragile system. Okay, and we're just going to normalize the probability of failure so that p of one is one. So the total, if the total utilization of the resource is one, it fails with 100% probability. Okay. All right. So even with those sort of convexity and concavity assumptions on R and P, uh, it turns out that this utility function, because of this probability, this uh, uh, prospect theoretic value function, isn't. Uh, concave or supermodular or anything like that in general. Okay, It's not a very nice looking function in general. So you can't just apply standard convex games or supermodular games and other things to argue that there's going to be a Nash equilibrium. So what we had to do was instead look at this a little bit more carefully and do a first principles analysis to try and characterize the uh, presence of Nash equilibrium. Okay, so we call the best response of a player, I, the uh, investment that the player I makes in order to maximize their utility function. Okay? And so here we show that 
regardless of whether the, the resource uh, rate of return is decreasing or increasing, and despite the fact that this is not concave everywhere, it always has a unique maximizer, and that maximizer is always continuous in the investments of the other players. Okay? And so based on those two things, that's efficient to use Brouwer's fixed point theorem to argue that there's always a Nash equilibrium in this game. Okay, so you do a first principles analysis and that uh, spot, uh, gets spit out. And it turns out that that Nash equilibrium is also going to be unique. All right, and just to make sure everybody's on the same page, a pure Nash equilibrium is essentially a set of actions by the players such that if everybody else's actions are fixed, I get no benefit by changing my action. Okay? All right, so this is sort of you know, step zero, right? You need a Nash equilibrium to be able to talk about the properties of Nash equilibrium, and there always exists a Nash equilibrium, unique, uh, even when players have their own alpha i's and k i's, their own behavioral perceptions of what's happening in the system. Okay, so this next question that we're gonna ask then is given that there exists a Nash equilibrium, what is the, what we call, fragility under competition? How does the failure probability of the resource at the Nash equilibrium compare to the failure probability of the resource when there's a single player in the game? So this is gonna characterize the effect of competition in the game. And since we're characterizing the effect of competition, here we're gonna remove the axis corresponding to heterogeneity. So let's suppose that all the players are homogeneous because we wanna isolate the effects of competition. And so we're gonna denote two things here. So if you have n players, we're going to let xn denote the total Nash equilibrium investment. And we're going to denote, uh, use xo to denote the optimal investment if there was a single player in the game. Okay? And so fragility under competition then we define as this ratio here. So probability of failure at the Nash equilibrium divided by the probability of failure under a single player in the game. Okay. All right, so the main result here is as follows. So suppose that for simplicity, we have a more general characterization, but for simplicity to illustrate this, suppose that the probability of failure of the resource is this monomial, it's x to the d, right? So essentially it looks like this. So as d gets bigger and bigger, you get more and more uh, sharp transition from zero to one here. So under these conditions, it turns out that you can always upper bound this fragility un under competition by certain constants. Okay? And so if the resource has an increasing rate of return, then the ratio of these failure probabilities is always upper bounded by one plus d over alpha, where again d is this exponent. Alpha, remember, is what shapes how S-shaped the uh, prospect theoretic value function is. Okay? Similarly, if the resource has a decreasing rate of return, you can always also upper bound it. It's a different constant now. It's one plus two over alpha to the power of d. Okay. So one thing to note is that the only thing that these constants depend on are how convex this failure probability function is and essentially how skewed people's perceptions of values are. Okay. So the first observation here is getting back to the question that we were asking, which is what is the impact of behavioral perceptions of values on how people use resources and how fragile the resource gets? And so the answer that this is telling us is that prospect theoretic individuals will tend to overutilize the resource compared to non-prospect theoretic individuals. Okay, so specifically when alpha becomes less than one, then you get, you, that's when you start to get that S-shaped shaping. And when alpha becomes smaller than one, as alpha gets smaller and smaller, this starts to get bigger and bigger. Okay, so if you are designing or managing this resource and you don't account for the fact that people are, people are prospect theoretic, you're going to underestimate the probability of failure of your resource. The second observation is in terms of how D enters into the picture. So here D, which is the exponent here, enters uh, linearly in this upper bound, whereas here D enters in an exponential fashion in the upper bound. Okay, and the reason for this is actually intuitive. So suppose that the resource has an increasing rate of return. So now consider a single player using this resource. So the more they use the resource, the more benefit they get from this resource, but there's a failure probability and so forth. But because of this increasing rate of return, a single player, when they're playing on their own, is already pretty aggressive in how much they use the resource. So there isn't that much left in the resource for other people to snatch up when they come into the game. And so when they do come in, there is an increase, but it increases only linearly in D. On the other hand, when the resource has a decreasing rate of return, there's this congestion effect. So if you're a single player using this resource, you're already somewhat conservative in how much you use it, and you're leaving a lot of the resource unused. But when more players come into the game, they're selfish and they grab up whatever's left over, and that causes a huge increase in the failure probability. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, this, this analysis uh, makes uh, a lot of sense, assuming that somehow the upper bound 
is tight or, or exactly or yeah that's right so essentially this is always this is tight when you have a resource with a constant rate of return uh -huh. so then you get this to be tight this is uh, this is loose but the uh, general characterization of an exponential increase in D is observed so essentially the bound itself is loose but the qualitative exponential increase in D uh, does occur yeah yeah I, I think it's really nice analysis but it occurs to me that it, it sort of simultaneously assumes the players are imperfect, but also perfectly knowledgeable. Because I believe in order to compute their best response, they need right. to know these quantities like R. They do need to know they R, to yeah. Know R. They might need to know P. That's right, things. exactly. So they, yeah, so they're assumed yet, to know. Yet their ability to perceive the utility of certain actions That's is right. Flawed. That's so right. it's sort of a weird contradiction. But you have to keep in mind that they're, they're the utility function is not necessarily a flaw. It just the utility function represents the decision maker's preferences with respect to gains and losses. Right. So it's not necessarily a, a flaw in the decision maker's logic. It just represents that they're not risk neutral. And I guess the question I wanted to ask was, how much of this analysis can be um, reused or remain the same insights do you get? if you use other utility functions besides this particular one, which is only one of many possible utility functions. That's right. So you mean in terms of the way that the values are shaped? So if you don't assume uh, this type of shaping, what happens? Is that right. the question? Yeah, so essentially, um, I think one of the key points is that this alpha is what's playing a role. And this alpha shows up in this S-shaped uh, function. If you try and compare this directly to things like risk-neutral behavior, right? So in that case, where everybody's just viewing it in a, a linear fashion, that occurs when alpha is equal to 1 and k is equal to 1. So that very specific utility function ends up being a special case, and we can do that comparison directly but there, but there are others exactly and so it's not clear whether you know like uh, you can talk about utility functions that are concave everywhere which would be the classical one and in that case this that cannot be captured as a special case of this other than the scenario where alpha is equal to one and k is bigger than one in which case you get a line here and a line here and so that's sort of a upper envelope to a concave function and in that case also the that you know that becomes a special case of our analysis but more general utility functions how we compare that to this we're not sure yeah yeah but in response to your other question about how much the users need to know yes they do need to have preferences over their own selections and so you can imagine even you know your the quote unquote the rate of return of the resources advertised in some way right you can imagine it's a you know a stock that you're investing in and you're told there's going to be a certain return on it uh, this is a historical return but you may still perceive the return that you get from it in a skewed manner and so and you may also be told that you know there's a 50 percent probability that this thing is going to fail but still the fact that you're told that doesn't impact the way that, you know, just because you know it's 50% doesn't change the fact that you perceive that 50% in a skewed manner. The other thing that I didn't talk about here is that you don't actually need to know the individual investments or the utility functions of the other players in the game. This turns out to be what's called an aggregative game, and so uh, you only need to know the total investment of the other players, how much other people are using the resource for you to make your decision about how much you want to invest. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Any other questions? I think it's interesting on, the, on that slide. This one? The uh, next one. If you, if you didn't know R, yeah. whether it was increasing or decreasing, right. there's sort of probably a, a neutral choice of investment. Hmm. Yeah, uncertainty in the character. Like, yeah. Like That's if R was just flat. You didn't know if it was going up or down. Right. Then you probably pick something around at 0.5, it looks like. Yeah, if R is flat, then essentially, uh, yeah, it falls into both both scenarios. And so you still get a curve that looks like one of these two things, and the analysis still holds. Uh, you won't necessarily pick something in the middle because it'll depend on the failure probability function and so forth. But uh, yeah, I mean, it comes out as a special case. Yeah. Yeah. OK. All right, so the main takeaway here was that uh, competition among prospect theoretic players makes the way they use the resource worse compared to non-prospect theoretic players. Uh, but then you can also ask the question about social planners, right? So rather than considering a private good versus a public good, so one player versus multiple players, imagine now you have a regulator or somebody who's managing the resource and they say, I'm not going to let you just come in and use the resource how you want. I'm going to allocate portions of the resource to you in such a way that I maximize social welfare. Okay, so then I can ask the question, what is the probability of failure at the Nash equilibrium compared to probability of failure at the social welfare maximizing 
utilization. So it turns out for this class of games here, when you have homogeneous players, there's a nice property that the uh, total investment prescribed by a social welfare maximizer ends up being the same as the total utilization uh, under a single player in the game. Okay, so that just ends up being the way math works out. And so what the fragility of the under competition metric, yeah. A little more precise. What is the social? What exactly is the social welfare function? Here? Right. So it's the sum of all the utilities. The sum of the utility. That's right. So essentially, each. Oh, they're homogeneous. They're homogeneous. Okay. Right. Exactly. So each player has their own utility for using the resource, and as a, as a government agency or regulator, I want to allocate a portion of this resource to each person so that each, the sum of all the utilities is maximized. So then it turns out that the portion, when I add up all those little chunks together, that'll end up being exactly equal to the amount that a single player would use a resource on their own. Essentially, you would split the uh, amount that a single player would use on their own equally among all the players using this resource. Okay. And so then the fragility under competition bounds that we had earlier, they have this equivalent interpretation that it's not just the failure probability of the Nash equilibrium to the failure probability under a single player, but it's also equal to the failure probability under Nash equilibrium to failure probability under social welfare maximizing solution. Okay, and so the same insights that we had before still hold. So what this says is that if you have a social planner, the benefit of a social planner in terms of reducing the fragility of your resource is even greater when you have prospect theoretic players compared to the case when you don't have prospect theoretic players. Okay. All right, so third question is fragility under heterogeneity. Is it better to have homogeneous risk attitudes or heterogeneous risk attitudes? Okay, so uh, to consider this, let's isolate a couple of different things. So we'll keep, keep the resource fixed. It's the same resource. Uh, we're going to have n players, but we're going to consider two different scenarios. So in the first scenario, we're going to keep uh, all the alphas the same, because there's two parameters in prospect theory, right? Alpha and k. Okay, we're going to keep all the alphas the same, but in the first society, all the players have different loss aversion indices. They have different perceptions of loss. So that's K1 through Kn. And let's say capital K is the mean loss aversion index. In scenario two, you have a very homogeneous society. Everybody has the same perceptions towards loss, okay? And so all their loss aversion indices are equal to Ki. But to compare these two in a fair way, we're going to set that Ki to be the mean loss aversion index here. So you have a heterogeneous spread, a homogeneous society, but the mean loss aversion is the same. Okay, then it turns out that it's better to have homogeneous perceptions towards loss compared to heterogeneous perceptions towards loss in terms of how much the society uses your resource. Okay, and the reason for that is essentially as follows. When you have this kind of a spread, you have some people who are hurt more by losses and some people who are hurt less by losses. People who are hurt more by losses tend to back off from using the resource, right? They don't like this failure probability and they, when they lose, it really hurts them. But people who are hurt less than uh, by hurt less by losses, they are going to be more aggressive in terms of how much they use the resource. And it turns out how much more aggressive they become more than compensates for how much people back off. Okay? So as a policy implication, I don't know how you would do it, but if you could somehow get people to have a more uniform perception of losses in your society, this analysis, at least under these, this model and so forth, suggests that that would be better for your resource. Does this apply to people's attitude towards the overall of the... No, this is completely selfish decision making. Yeah. But, but I think that's the same problem, right? Some, if somebody is not selfish... Right. You know, and say, for example, you doesn't use plastic bags, yeah. but the other people are, yeah. and this exact analysis applies. Yeah, it potentially could, yeah. So I, I'm hesitant to say it applies directly because the, uh, in this scenario, the, the loss that they experience is only due to whatever investment they've personally made in protecting this resource, but they do not suffer a loss due to global failure. If you included a loss due to global failure, then potentially similar insights will hold. I have a feeling similar insights would hold, but the current utility function doesn't capture loss due to the resource itself, other than that's what you lose. That's right, that's right. Uh, that's varying the probability, but also the loss, it's not just you losing your investment, it's some big catastrophic loss due to society, you know, turning into zombies or whatever it is. Well, yeah. how about global warming? Right. Yeah, exactly. So, you mean, but you would lose something there. The model that we're looking at currently would have to be modified to say you're not just losing, you know, the fact that you can't go outside, but you're losing the fact that society can't grow crops and so forth. And so there has to be a bigger loss, uh, loss term included in your utility function. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the, that's heterogeneity and loss aversion, but the 
A similar clean statement for heterogeneity in the alpha, fun alpha parameters cannot uh, be stated. So essentially, if you have heterogeneity in alphas, then there are some scenarios where the heterogeneous society is better in terms of utilizing the resource, and some scenarios where it's worse. Okay? So uh, there isn't a blanket statement that heterogeneous societies are better or worse. Uh, under uniform uh, sensitivity parameters, heterogeneity in loss aversion is worse. Okay. All right, so what do we do about it, right? So can you reduce utilization of this resource and try and control it in some way? So this is a paper that's gonna appear at CDC this year, and so the first shot that we're looking at this as is, can you just impose a tax, right? So if, I'm, if you're trying to use this resource, I don't like how, many, how much you guys are using my resource, I'm gonna tax you for using this resource. It's sort of a first natural thing you could try. So if a player is investing XI in the resource, then they pay me a, a, a a fee of t times xi, where t is the tax rate. So how effective is such a thing at reducing the Nash equilibrium? Is yeah. there a reason why you only consider linear function rather than trying to capture the externalities? Uh, no, for, this is a first shot, first uh, attempt, yeah. So essentially those are the questions about how do you optimally design incentives is uh, we haven't looked at. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So. First thing is, uh, something interesting will happen here, but first thing is how do you capture, what happens when you impose a tax rate? Okay, so what happens mathematically? So, the utility of the player under the tax looks as follows. So if the resource exceeds, I get my return, xi times r, but then I've paid a tax, so it's minus t times xi. So the total return that I get from the resource is xi times r minus whatever I've paid, right? So that's the gain, and I raise that to the alpha power, shape it according to prospect theory. If the resource fails, I lose whatever investment or time or whatever I put into the resource, I get no return from it. I've also paid a tax to actually participate in using this resource, and so my total loss is my investment that I've lost plus the tax that I've paid, right? Okay, and so then it's again shaped, uh, amplified by K and shaped according to alpha. So then when you put it back into the utility function, you get a utility function like this, and the main thing to note here is that this looks exactly like the utility function from before. The only thing that's different is that the rate of return gets decreased by T, and then this, this uh, tax rate in the loss gets factored out like this, and so the, the loss aversion parameter essentially changes to be original loss aversion parameter times one plus T to the alpha I. So imposing a tax mathematically is equivalent to saying I'm reducing the rate of return of the resource and making people more loss averse. Okay? And so you would expect when you do all this that things are going to get better. But surprisingly, if you charge people a tax in certain cases, they can actually use the resource more. Okay? And so why the heck does that happen? So Here's just a couple of plots illustrating what's happening here. So here, if you increase the tax rate, the utilization monotonically increases. Here, if you increase the tax rate, the utilization decreases for a while and then increases. And it turns out this phenomenon occurs when you have resources that have increasing rates of return. So imagine that you have resources that, that have this economies of scale or network effects. So you have people that you're charging a tax for. Okay, so their return from the resource decreases. But they realize that if they use the resource more, they can get more out of it. So they use the resource more to compensate for the loss that they're experiencing due to paying a tax. Now, of course, when, they, when you use the resource more, the probability of failure increases, so the chance that you lose something increases. But if you're very gain-seeking, you're not really sensitive to losses at all, you're gambling with other people's money, then in that case, you don't really care that the resource is gonna fail, and so then you try and pump more from the resource to compensate. That sounds familiar. It does, <laughs> exactly. So. If you remember Bernie versus Hillary back in the day, good old days of this crazy election, right? So Bernie had this thing where he said, we're going to tax Wall Street speculation to pay for free universities, right? So Wall Street speculation, again, this is not, I'm not claiming this as a perfect fit for the model, but that is a case. I'm actually thinking about the fact that if you're playing with other people's money. Exactly. It's more like DJT, I think. It's more? DJT. DJ, ah, okay. Well, let's not go there. <laughs> yeah. But under the Wall Street speculation model, which could include DJT as a player, uh, the if you're very gain-seeking, so you don't care about the losses that you incur, and the resource has positive externality. So the more speculation that occurs, the more bubble builds up, the more you gain from it. If you were to tax Wall Street speculation under Bernie's plan, you would actually increase speculation. 
Okay, and so that would be great for paying for public universities, right? So you'd actually get a ton more money, but you'd push the system closer to failure. That's the interpretation of this result. But this assumes that the tax rate is uniform. Exactly. Yep. If you had increasing tax at yep. higher level of utilization, that would presumably undo this. Potentially, potentially, exactly. Yeah, so this first observation is essentially that imposing a tax rate, when we apply, approached it, we were like, there's probably nothing interesting here. It should always just decrease utilization. It, this is just saying, just be careful. It doesn't, it's not always the case that you just apply it and it's going to work the way you think. So yeah. why is the, the amount of tax you pay also raised to the power of alpha? Uh, so T itself is raised to the power of alpha, but remember when you fail, this is essentially you've paid, you lost your investment, and this is how much tax you've paid, T times XI, and so this is the total loss you feel, and so that amount is raised to the power of alpha. And so when you just factor out the one plus T, you get it. But yeah. that's not how taxes work. And anyway, when you get losses, yeah. you can deduct them. Oh, yeah. the, I mean, yeah. That's the DJT model, but... Sure, sure, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, we haven't uh, encoded IRS regulations in our model yet, so uh, <laughs> what, which next step. would that push it? Uh, when you deduct, it'll probably push it the other way where you, again, that makes you less loss averse, right? Essentially, if you're going to lose money, but you're just going to make it back, you're not going to care about this term as much. And so this KI is going to get smaller and smaller. That makes the problem worse. It'll make it worse. It'll make it worse. Exactly. It's even worse than what you're saying. It's even worse, yeah. Exactly. We haven't captured that, but it'll make it worse. At least we think so. We thought DAX has always increased, uh, decreased utilization, but intuitively it should make it worse. Any other questions? But okay. All right. So bad things can happen, but there are scenarios under which taxes will work the way you expect them to. So, for example, if everybody is loss averse, so you know they are playing with their own money, they don't like losing money. In that case, uh, a higher tax rate will decrease utilization, and uh, if the rate of return of the resource is decreasing, so there isn't this funny business where you kind of you know pump each other up to get more re uh, return from the resource. If there's always congestion effects, then a higher tax rate will always decrease utilization. Okay. So under certain scenarios, tax will work the way it's supposed to. All right. Any questions about common pool resource games and behavioral decision making? Have you considered a tier tax rate? <laughs> no. Yeah, so there's plenty, exactly. You can do things like, you know, uh, marginal pricing and congestion pricing and raise it to the uh, certain power and so forth. You could definitely. This is problematic. Sure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And because the, you know, the utility function is already kind of funny, we had to do the special case analysis or first principles analysis. We haven't gone there yet, but uh, it, it's a clear problem as to how you would actually do this. Yeah. Has any of your analysis considered the following scenario where this shared resource, rather than be um, sort of a community property, yeah. is just carved up, divided by N, yeah. and each individual just gets their share? Yeah. Yeah, that's the social welfare maximizer. Yeah, okay, exactly. That's, 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 by your that's right. So essentially, it turns out that the social welfare maximizer under homogeneous players is essentially doing that. They're carving out uh, the resource into different chunks and just telling each person to use a certain amount of it. Exactly. Yeah. But I'm, in, my, in my scenario, each individual can still make their own decisions about ah, how much okay. they use. It's just that rather than right. have a commons, right. you just give everybody a plot, and then they right. decide to use the plot however they choose. Right. Um, I mean, is there any benefit to having a commons? Well, it's not clear that your model, so that model, I think, will actually be covered under this analysis because what is happening is that as the number of players gets bigger and bigger, the portion of the resource that they use gets smaller and smaller. So even if you now uh, hypothetically say, you know, I'm going to carve out certain squares for you to use, each person is using a very little, a vanishingly small amount as n gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And so the, you know, as long as the portion that you're carving out doesn't shrink faster than the rate at which their utilization decreases, your model would fit within this framework. Uh, we'd have to do a little bit more careful analysis to characterize how quickly you'd have to carve the resource out with n, but uh, at a, sort of a first order approximation, I think what you're saying will get captured here. Yeah. Well, I don't know if you can use the same model for externalities and network effects. If you're actually allocating partition hmm. resources. Right, that's true. That's true. That's right. You don't get any benefits from other players uh, using. So the, yeah, the coupling would be through the probability of failure, probability, probably. But you're absolutely right. Yeah. 
Yeah, at least from a from a physical interpretation, you're right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So the second class of games that we're looking at is a class of interdependent security games. Okay. And so the the formulation here is as follows. So you have uh, a network of nodes, and each node uh, is deciding on how much they invest in security at that node to protect themselves. Okay. But the probability that the node gets attacked isn't just a function of how much they've invested, but it depends on how much their neighbors in the network have invested as well. Because I'm coupled with other people, security risks at my neighbors is going to translate into security risks for me, and so I have to take into consideration consideration what they're doing. Okay, and so there's lots of work in this space looking at different uh, types of uh, formulations. Richard, for example, has done recent work uh, on this area. Um, and so let's look at a certain mathematical formulation of this to try and understand the impacts of behavioral decision making. So again, we have n decision makers in the system. And player i security investment is going to be a number between 0 and 1. We're going to denote it by si, which is between 0 and 1. And then depending on what player i invests and what the other players invest, there's going to be a probability that the player is successfully attacked, okay, which is going to be fi, time, uh, fi, which is a function of their investment and the investments of the other players. So if you had a risk neutral player, this is the utility that they're trying to maximize. So in the case that they get attacked successfully, they incur a loss of LI. Okay? So that's this term here. And then this term here uh, represents the cost due to security investments that the players are making. So for each unit of investment in security that they're making, they have a cost CI. So they're trying to choose their uh, local security investments to maximize this. Now, depending on how FI looks, you're going to have different characteristics of this problem and so forth. Uh, here we're going to be looking at a fairly abstract model, which is loosely capturing the idea that the more people invest in security in my neighborhood, the better off I am. And that's called the total effort model. And so here, the probability that I'm successfully attacked is just 1 minus the average security investment in my neighborhood. So the higher the average investment, the better off I am. Okay. So here, di is going to be the size of this neighborhood, which is 1 plus the number of neighbors of node i, and ni is just the set of neighbors of node i. Okay, so, so to establish a baseline then, let's just see what happens when everybody is risk neutral and is just trying to maximize that utility. So then you have this utility here, you're trying to maximize it with respect to your personal security investment, SI. So it's either going to be 0 or 1, or it's going to be something that causes the first order condition to hold here. Take the derivative, set it equal to 0. And it turns out for this simple model, nothing interesting happens, right? So you take the derivative with respect to SI, set it equal to 0. That's, that derivative is just a constant. And if that constant is bigger than zero, you just put all in, you throw in as much security as you can. And if the constant is less than zero, then you don't invest in security at all. It's not worth it for you to invest. In the pathological case where the constant is equal to, uh, this constant is equal to zero, then you can do whatever you want. But other than that pathological case, you know, it's kind of a very trivial scenario here where each person is either investing 100% in security or not investing at all. Okay? So the question that we're going to ask is what happens when you have behavioral probability weighting. So you have this probability that you're going to get attacked, but if you don't perceive that probability in its true fashion, if you have this sort of skewed perception of it, what does that do to the Nash equilibria in this game? Okay, and so once there once you characterize that there exists Nash equilibria, what are the uh, effects of this behavioral probability weighting, and how do you design networks in order to minimize the fraction of nodes that are successfully attacked? Okay? So just to refresh your memory about the weighting function, people underweight, or sorry, overweight low probabilities, underweight high probabilities, and we're going to be focusing on a mathematical parametrization of this effect given by what's uh, known as the prelock weighting function, where W is the skewed function here, and that's parametrized by beta, which is a number between 0 and 1. 1 is perfectly linear. As beta gets smaller, you get uh, more and more skewing. So what does that do to the utility function? It's exactly the same as before, but now when, they're, when this player is making his or her decision, there's the true probability of successful attack. They perceive that through the lens of this skewed probability function. Everything else is the same. So the only thing that changes is that this gets put into this function w. And we're going to call it wi because we're going to allow the players to have their own skewing, their own beta, beta uh, constants. Okay. So again, player i is trying to maximize this utility function. So their investment is either going to be at the boundaries, 0 or 1, or it's going to be such that the first order condition holds here. Okay. So you take the derivative of this with respect to si, and you set it equal to 0. So now, because of this weighting function, 
uh, more interesting things happen with this first order condition. And so the first derivative of the weighting function shows up here. And so uh, whatever SI, if it's if it's an interior optimizer, uh, whatever SI that is, is going to satisfy this condition where WI prime of this argument is equal to DC by L. So this is some constant. Okay, And so this looks complicated, but essentially when you plot it out, this blue curve is W prime, and this, uh, this constant on the right is just this straight line here. So wherever these intersection points are, those are candidate arguments to satisfy the first order condition. Okay, and so we're going to be interested in these intersection points, so we're going to call this intersection point x1 and this intersection point x2. Okay. All right. So first result is under some mild technical conditions, which guarantee that they're, you know, the best responses are continuous and so forth. Uh, the best response is unique, continuous, decreasing in the investments of the other players. So again, by Brouwer's fixed point theorem, there always exists a Nash equilibrium. So that's at least a first uh, kind of baseline by which we can uh, evaluate things. So now, given that there's a Nash equilibrium, the question then is, how does behavioral probability weighting change things compared to the baseline model where there isn't? So remember, in the baseline model, everybody, each person either invests completely or they don't. So it turns out that under behavioral probability weighting, you actually do get now more interesting investments at the Nash equilibrium. You get a much more uh, sophisticated landscape of security investments. Okay. So for example, on a deregular graph with homogeneous players where everybody has the same number of neighbors and the same costs and, uh, and losses, then there's always a, uh, an interior equilibrium where the true attack probability is going to be equal to this intersection point here. Okay, so without probability weighting, that there was always the only equilibria were all at zero or one, depending on this parameter here. But under probability weighting, you can get equilibria that line up here. You said there. Uh oh, sorry. Should I repeat what I said? Is that okay? Siri is confused. Um, the other interesting thing that happens here is that in any graph and under potentially heterogeneous uh, risk attitudes, it'll never be the case that you have a completely unprotected equilibrium. Okay? That could ha happen without probability weighting, but under probability weighting with prelect type functions, that'll never happen. And the reason for that is as follows. So essentially, suppose everybody in your system is invest in your neighborhood is investing zero. Right? So you're over here. You have a true probability of attack of one. Now you're trying to decide, should I invest in security at all? Now, when you invest a little bit in security, the security risk drops, but your perceived drop in security risk is actually quite high. And so you feel like your investment in security is making a big difference, much bigger than it actually is, and that causes you to actually invest in security and try and make the system more secure. Okay? Yes? It's just a picky thing, but the attack probability can't depend on your perception. What you mean is the successful attack probability. Exactly. That's right. That's right. So the successful attack probability is in this model is one minus the average investment. Yeah. That's right. Exactly. So we have not captured external factors that represent attack probability. You're maybe more likely to be targeted for attack, yeah. but you're right. Successful attack probability. Yes. Okay. So uh, main outcome from the slide, behavioral decision making leads to more interesting equilibria and you get things like you get actually, uh, you don't get fully insecure systems which is what you see in the real world. Okay? So, but the fact that behavioral probability weighting leads to more uh, realistic equilibria doesn't necessarily answer the question, is it better to have probability weighting or not? Right? So, uh, or meaning, is it better to have people who have more skewed perceptions of probabilities or less skewed perceptions of probabilities? And it turns out that the answer depends on the network and the nature of the attacks. So if you're in a, again in a deregular network just to uh, remove the uh, complications due to network topology and so forth, so suppose that you have two different types of players, one with a lot of probability skewing and one with less. Okay? So then it turns out if the number of neighbors in your network that each node has is very high, then it's better for the system that the players have very skewed perceptions of probabilities. On the other hand, if the number of neighbors that each node has is very low, it's better for the system that each player has a more realistic perception of probabilities. Okay, and why is this? So essentially, if the number of neighbors that each player has is high, then the, you're essentially each player is facing threats from a lot of their neighbors, and so the probability of successful attack is already very high. So in that case, you're operating in this regime, and it's the same analysis as before, where people feel in this regime that small investments make a big difference, and the bigger your skewed perception, the bigger you feel your difference is making, and so you tend to invest more. So if you have very dense networks, it's better to have people who don't 
understand probability in a true fashion. Okay? On the other hand, if you're in the middle here where everybody has very few neighbors, then their threat is actually pretty small. It's in a moderate range. And here, people who have skewed perceptions or probabilities in the middle don't feel like their investments are making a difference. They feel like their investments are making less of a difference than they actually are. So in that case, it's better to have people who have true, more linear perceptions or probability. Okay. So the answer is it depends. Okay. And so then the last part here is basically then asking the question, okay, we, now we understand a little bit about how behavioral probability weighting affects how people make investments. Now suppose that you want to design a network topology, right? So you're going to design a network, you're going to deploy it, people who are on this network are going to make investments according to what we've been understanding. What kinds of networks are good in terms of minimizing the expected fraction of nodes that are successfully attacked at the Nash equilibrium? Okay. And so to answer this question, we have this sort of first result, which per first provides an upper bound on the probability that a given node is successfully attacked. It turns out that under those mild conditions under which uh, equilibria exists and so forth, the probability that node i is successfully attacked is upper bounded by this, uh, this quantity here, which characterizes the intersection point between this curve and that. Okay, And so this second intersection point is going to be key in terms of at least giving us a quantity that we're trying to minimize. Okay, And so since the second intersection point is a function of the degree of the node, so this red line, as the degree gets bigger and bigger, this line moves higher and higher, this intersection point moves to the right, we're going to be parameterizing this by the degree. We're going to take the C and the L to be uniform across players because we're trying to design the network. We don't want the heterogeneity and losses and gains to uh, enter into the picture. So we're going to keep those uniform as just D can change. Okay, so because we're going to be interested in this, it's a function of d, we're going to refer to it as a function of the degree d. Okay, so if we're trying to minimize the expected fraction of nodes that are successfully attacked, that's just the average of the successful attack probabilities here. That's upper bounded by this function, as we said before. So what is the degree sequence that minimizes this function, this cost? Okay, and to answer this question, we're going to consider a slightly more general question. So I give you a graph on uh, n nodes and I associate a cost with that graph and that cost is just a sum of function, uh, uh, sum of some functions of the degree of the graph. Okay, And suppose that the function has some kind of uh, weird looking properties as increasing concave, its first derivative is, has some convexity properties and so forth. Suppose I gave you a function like this and I gave you a function that satisfies these properties, what class of graphs on n nodes and e edges minimizes such a cost? And it turns out a class of graphs called quasi-complete graphs are going to be what end up being optimal. And so a quasi-complete graph on n nodes and e edges is basically a graph that contains as big a clique as possible with those edges. Okay, so if e is equal to p choose 2 for some p, then the graph just contains a clique on p nodes and nothing, uh, and all the other nodes are isolated. And if e is less than p choose 2 but bigger than p minus 1 choose 2, then you form as big a clique as possible. So you have a clique on p minus 1 nodes and then you add the remaining edges from one other node to as many nodes as possible inside the clique. So you're trying to build as big a clique as possible. Okay, so that's why it's quasi-complete. It's as close to complete as you can make it with the given number of edges. So then the theorem ends up being that if you have a function, a cost function, like this, where f satisfies these properties, quasi-complete graphs are the optimal graphs for minimizing that cost. Okay, and this is a pretty straightforward generalization of a result that appeared in this Journal of Graph Theory in 2002, where they consider a specific uh, function f. We just generalize it a little bit for this more general class of functions. And the reason we do that is because if we go back to this function that we were trying to minimize, which is this upper bound on the fraction of nodes that are successfully attacked, we can show that under certain conditions on the cost and so forth, this function actually does satisfy those properties. Okay? So the main result then is that within the class of graphs on n nodes and e edges, the quasi-complete graphs are the ones that minimize at least the bounds on the fraction of nodes that are successfully attacked at a Nash equilibrium. And the reason for, the intuition behind this is as follows. So remember, in these networks, the more neighbors you have, the more security risk you face. So the idea behind minimizing the fraction of nodes that are successfully attacked is to just concentrate all of that risk on as few nodes as possible. So if you have to build a no network with E edges, you put all those edges between as few nodes as possible and you try and leave all the other people as isolated as possible so they don't have to participate in security risks. Okay? So now you want to look at the problem where there's a constraint that says you have to be 
Exactly. So among all connected graphs on n nodes, the, n the network that minimizes the expected fraction is the star network. So it's the same intuition. You're trying to minimize the degrees as much as possible. The best I could do in a connected network is to have degree one nodes as much as I can, and then all of the risk is concentrated on that hub node. Now, if you have a further constraint on the number of edges, E, then we're, we have some initial characterizations of uh, networks that minimize that, but we haven't cut done the complete characterization yet. Does that argue that, that um, in this case you should have some sort of filter nodes that you know sort of, uh, that have lots of connections to some specific nodes that are there, or, or very few connections to some specific nodes that are there to isolate different parts? Yeah. So. One thing to keep in mind about these utility functions is that the only thing that the uh, cost function on the graph captured was the, the security risk. But it doesn't capture things like maybe I need to be connected to a certain number of individuals in order to uh, function properly. Or maybe I need to be in a big enough uh, you know, uh, component uh, even after a failure so that I could remain connected and so forth. So when we introduce those more realistic uh, assumptions, then you may ha end up doing things like you know, concentrate as many of the edges on as few nodes as possible with the constraint that each other node is connected to a certain number of those, those nodes and so forth. Yeah, so there may be more complicated things that arise if you consider more realistic cost functions. Yeah. Do you have some idea how this whole picture will change if you change the model to minimum effort or maximum effort? Uh, so weakest link or best shot, basically. So yeah, so we've looked at this case, so we've looked at all three. So total effort is your probability of successful attack is one minus average. Weakest link is, uh, I don't care about the average, I care about the weakest person in my neighborhood. In that case, uh, under weakest link, it turns out everybody in the network at all Nash equilibria will invest the same amount, and that makes sense. Uh, but that, compared to the case without probability weighting, there's a bigger uh, set of values that people will invest at the security. Uh, under best shot, what happens is that my security risk is given by the strongest person in my neighborhood. So essentially, I want a redundancy, and as long as at mo uh, there's at least one guy standing after the attack, I'm still OK. In that case, it turns out there will be the set of players that invest at an Ash equilibrium form a uh, maximal independent set, basically. And so yeah, the landscape changes. Uh, the characterizations change. Yeah. And you said before that you have not yet looked at the case of um, the adversary targeting no. a specific that's right. that's right. to targeting all, everybody? Exactly, that's right. We have not looked at that. That's right. So under this very simple model, uh, the, the attack probability, when we say attack, isn't actually a uh, targeted attack. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, and so just to wrap that up then, the heterogeneous distributions tend to be good in terms of minimizing fraction of no successfully attacked nodes. The homogeneous distributions tend to be bad then. So essentially when you have a very uniform distribution over the degrees, then the fraction of successfully attacked nodes at the Nash equilibrium is highest. Okay, so let me just summarize. So the main uh, characterization here was that we wanted to understand what are the impacts of behavioral models of decision making on robustness and security of these large scale systems. So uh, prospect theoretic players in resource sharing games tend to overutilize resources compared to their non-prospect theoretic counterparts. Benefit of a social planner is greater when you have prospect theoretic players under these you know, the parameters of a model, of course. And control mechanisms such as tax taxes can be beneficial, can be effective, but you have to be very careful. They're not going to work all the time. And then in interdependent security games, Behavioral probability weighting might be one explanation for why we see a much a more interesting range of Nash equilibria compared to risk neutral models. Uh, misperceptions of probability can be beneficial under high threat scenarios, uh, and more linear perceptions of probabilities are better under low, uh, medium threat scenarios. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>